order the December 2nd, 2019 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board be recorded by ACMI. Thanks everyone for coming out in the weather this evening. Uh, I'm going to hand <coughs> things off to the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning uh, master students this evening to present us uh, the Broadway Carter student project. So please introduce yourselves and, and have at it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the Arlington Redevelopment Board for having us and to members of the community who are also here. We appreciate your time, um, taking time to listen to us. Uh, recount to you what we've been doing for the last three or four months in our um, study project. Um, we looked at the Arlington Corridor and I'm here to introduce us to you. My name is Ian Ollis um, and I'm joined tonight by two of our colleagues from the class, um, Griffin Kans and Kendrick, my many mules. Um, the rest of our class members' names are over here. Wei, Peter, um, John Fay can't be with us this evening. He's been involved in a vehicle accident. Um, Ogyan, Baktang, Ken Kendrick I've already introduced, Paolo, and Mary Hannah. Um, we make up a team from MIT and one from Harvard that has been doing a practicum at MIT in planning and our project um, this semester was to look at a particular uh, project on the ground, in this case the Broadway Corridor in Arlington. Um, as you can see um, in our view um, there hasn't been a detailed study of the Broadway Corridor so far that we are aware of. It has been mentioned in the 2015 Master Plan and the 2017 Arts and Culture Action Plan, um, but we, in conjunction with the planning department here in Arlington, um, have embarked on this project to just investigate this corridor and um, study all of the details around it. What is our role? Well, to study this corridor we've been speaking to the local community, conducting workshops, and looking at um, what recommendations we could possibly make for the area going into the future. And we mapped out for ourselves a study area, which you can <coughs> see is bounded by the blue lines on the map. This is Broadway in yellow with the various bus stops of the T along Broadway corridor and um, we mapped out that particular study area as an area for us to study as a um, chunk that is uh, digestible for a team like ourselves at MIT. Um, and we've listed <coughs> there for you the, east, the, the various boundaries in terms of streets and we, we used those particular boundaries because they made up specific census block groups and tracks which were <coughs> useful to our particular study. What have we been doing? We began in September with some initial <coughs> research. We met with the planning department. We attended the Arlington Town Day. We, I think, bumped into a number of you there. Um, and we began assembling data about the area, looking at the census and the community surveys. We've done interviews. We, you'll see in photographs and slides later on how we've put up tables along the Broadway corridor and spoken to the community. We've met with um, various community groups. We've emailed a lot of people and asked for their ideas and their suggestions. In November, we followed on with additional stakeholder meetings. We had particular public meetings, which you'll see in a while, and started looking at um, concepts of what could be developed in this area in future. Tonight, we're presenting to yourselves, and after some feedback from you, we're going to be completing a printed and bound uh, report of the area. So first of all, our community engagement. Um, you can see our tables along Broadway on various uh, Saturdays and Sundays to speak to the local community. And we ask them questions. What do you like about Broadway, about the area? What don't you like about it? What do you think uh, could see some improvement? We've done some direct outreach with local groups. We've met with Equitable Arlington, the Arlington Residents for Responsible Redevelopment, the Housing Corp, the Mystic River Watershed Group, the Thompson's Elementary School Parent-Teacher Organization. We've knocked on doors of businesses along the corridor. I remember one of our members, Pito, standing over there on a Sunday morning, went and knocked on the doors of a whole bunch of businesses and just asked um, those who work in 
various stores and owners of businesses what their views are. We emailed out, particularly asking people their comments on mobility, on walking along the corridor, riding your bicycle, driving your car, riding on the bus, <coughs> um, how that um, feels to you and um, any problems you might have picked up. <coughs> we then ran a community workshop on the 28th of October <coughs> at Hardy Elementary School. We had about 24 community members who participated in the workshop and we laid out maps on tables and had people tell us what they thought was good about the area, what needed improvement. <coughs> they drew things that they thought um, could be worked on and um, we've incorporated many of the ideas we've heard from people who attended these various meetings, also done what we call in-reach. So we've met with the tree committee, the police department, the transportation advisory committee and so on um, to get <coughs> the as well. Out of that we distilled some areas of focus which we believed um, needed some more intensive study um, under three headings, housing, mobility and the character of the neighborhood. And um, in looking at housing, we looked at some particular sites along the corridor, what is currently the Leahy building, which to us appears as a gateway into the corridor from um, the Somerville side. We looked at the street streetscape along um, the corridor and what mobility issues there might be, and also the neighborhood character, and we focused on the Luciano Field area, the buildings around it, uh, what they look like today, and what perhaps they could be. I'm going to hand over to my colleague who's going to carry on with the housing section of our presentation and he will hand over to our final member of our presentation. At the end, we're going to take questions and comments from you to be facilitated by us as well. So thanks, Griffin. Sure. Ian might have to depart early for another engagement that he has, but he'll stick around for a little bit more. Uh, I'll introduce the first of the three top the subjects that we investigated as, uh, as part of this uh, study. Um, these, demogra these uh, figures sort of speak themselves, but they, they summarize some of our demographic and, and quantitative findings related to housing around the corridor. Um, overall, the most prominent issue that we heard from residents in person and also in written form was the issue of affordability. 37% uh, of residents in the study area are what are considered cost burdened, so over 30% of their household income goes towards housing costs. And over 11 or 11 percent of households spend over half their income on housing. Um, and in in these following figures, SA stands for study area. We were comparing the study area of the Brawl the one that we outlined around Burlington Court, the Broadway corridor, with the town of Arlington, and also statewide. Um, mo the uh, balance of rented versus owned homes along this corridor is very even. Most of the households are either a single person or two people, and the median age of the built structure of the home is 60 years. Uh, for some, a lot of these homes which are wooden, this is approaching the time when re major renovations are needed or maybe a replacement is needed. Uh, this map highlights in, in shades of blue the density of household units around the town. Uh, and right here in the, cor in the corridor outlined in yellow is the, one of the densest areas of the town. Then also, it's a little bit difficult to see on this projector, but the colored dots represent different attractors or things to do, am amenities that people would walk to or bike to from their home. And there are tons along Mass Ave, of course, but there are only really five attractors in this corridor. I'm going to zoom in on that. And there's three markets, there's a pizza shop, and then there's a Dunkin'. There's not really that much to do in this corridor, even though there's a, there's a huge density of residents living here compared to the rest of the town. And perhaps, that, that perhaps that's something that we're arguing is worth fixing, providing more things to do or quicker access to things to do around, around where people live. These are some new developments that are coming in uh, on, that are going through the process part of, in part of this board. There's the 117 Broadway project, which has 14 affordable units coming in adjacent to the Luciano Field, which we'll be discussing later. Uh, and also there is the 8789 Broadway project, which is just three units uh, across the street, across North Union Street uh, from the Duncan. Oh, and something we'd like to point out, we, we found it, we, we're difficult, we had difficulties cross-referencing this, but we've uh, read somewhere that there are only 93 affordable units in all of the town. Um, I'll put an asterisk on that because we did have difficulties uh, confirming that, but if there are that few, 
and this un and this project alone is contributing 14. That means there is quite a need for some more affordable housing units. And this is a uh, quarter is an opportunity to bring in a few more. This is an image that we took from an, uh, a demonstration that uh, Sustainable Arlington had at Town Day. They asked, uh, surveyed people on what their thoughts were related to different housing and social issues. And uh, by far, housing affordability attracted the most comments. On the left, we, sur we summarized what we actually heard from residents in an email, uh, written form, from uh, the tabling, from the workshop. And of course, what people bring up most is the issue of affordability, but also the related concerns, um, the concern of having things to do that are nearby within walking distance. Um, uh, the the observation that this corridor has a lot, it has a lot of infrastructure for the develop level of commercial development that it, or the little level of development that it already has. Uh, so maybe there is a capacity to densify the corridor in terms of housing up to a threshold, but there is room for it. And there is room for this corridor to grow and um, accommodate a little bit more d density for the town. And this slide recommend uh, this slide summarizes our actual policy recommendations in, in two different themes. Uh, we'd like to emphasize the need to incentivize and make fin uh, financially and zoning uh, feasible uh, affordable housing along the corridor. Um, we advocate for reviewing some of the uh, density and height restrictions that. Um, create diffi uh, feasibility difficulties for affordable housing projects along the corridor. We would like to recommend uh, community processes for deciding how those restrictions might be amended to incentivize affordable housing. And we in particular would like to emphasize looking at underutilized land parcels such as the ones, the abandoned auto shop next to Luciano Field, which we'll highlight later, and also the huge parking lot at the Leahy building site, another one of our focus sites. Uh, that are, uh, in our opinion, underutilized and could host uh, more uh, more uses to better uh, uh, to better uh, benefit the corridor. And we'd also like to advocate the second theme of ensuring a better quality of life for new development that does come in uh, on Broadway. Uh, we want to make sure that development ha uh, mitigates flood um, mitigates hazards due to flooding and extreme weather and that uh, any ground floor uses should contribute to street life, making it a more enjoyable place to live for the people who do and will live there. The second thing that we covered was mobility. That was one of my specialties as part of our 10-person uh, staff. Uh, the, these figures summarize some of our, our quantitative findings on mobility. Again, SA stands for study area. As would be expected for Arlington and most of Massachusetts, car use is by far the most prominent way people get around, but Surprisingly, there is a high percentage of people who take transit or who bike or walk in this corridor, probably because it's right near the 87 bus line and it's a little, it's a denser part of the town. Um, most of the ways people get around to work, most people uh, in the corridor work in Boston, Cambridge, or Somerville, but most of the important transportation links are the regional ones, the, the ones that take people ha a half hour or an hour out of the town to wherever they're going to work in the, in the morning and then coming back to town in the evening. So we, those are the most important linkages that we're focusing on, on in terms of mobility. Um, in terms of the walkability network, the pedestrian network, the quarter has a lot uh, to go for it. It has sidewalks in every street, which not every neighborhood has, so that's a good thing to have. Uh, there are somewhat frequent crosswalks across Broadway and along it. And there is also great tree shading in some spots. But there are some weaknesses that we'd like to highlight. The shading isn't great in all spots. The crosswalks aren't frequent in all locations on Broadway. It's a little inconsistent. Uh, there are some safety concerns intersections, such as the Warren Street, uh, River Street intersection, which one resident in particular uh, described, quote unquote, as a death trap. Um, and these are some of the issues we'd like to highlight in terms of the walkability network. Um, oh, and one potential solution that we're just throwing out there uh, is, or is this uh, image of a curb, uh, curb extension, this is from NACTO, um, to address some of the, the, curb, the crosswalks at the Warren Street and Street intersection. Those curbs are cut for the turning radii of fire, of fire trucks, not really for human beings. So we're thinking uh, some improvements such as curb extensions, bulb outs, maybe even daylighting, taking away parking uh, one or two spaces in advance of the crosswalk so that there's more visibility of cars seeing a pedestrian waiting at the crosswalk. 
Those can improve the safety of these crosswalks greatly. We have some data on biking. On the left, we have an image from an app called Strava that's mostly for recreational and athletic users. And on the right, we have data from Lime Bikes uh, that's more on short trip, uh, short bike trips. But together, you can see uh, the coloration is a little, bit, a little bit hard to distinguish on this projector, but uh, the amount of bike traffic along Broadway is almost as much as the bike traffic on Mass Ave and the Minuteman Trail, and yet there's no bike infrastructure of any kind, uh, of any kind on Broadway. And we, um, on the left, you could see these are those are the existing <coughs> conditions. It's a bicycle so you either have to ride with traffic or squeeze in between the uh, traffic lane and the parking lane, whereas these are potential potential solutions. Just worth throwing out suggestions. There is space to work with along Broadway. There is a uh, space for bike lanes in two directions, either painted and adjacent to the traffic lane, or uh, with a more aggressive approach, um, taking space uh, from either one parking line on either side uh, uh, for a separated bike lane. These are just potential solutions. There's always a trade-off between the space required to implement something like this and the safety benefits that come with it. We would like to emphasize that there is a safety need and there is space to work with that bike lanes could be implemented on, onto Broadway. In terms of transit, there's just the one bus line, the 87. It runs weekdays and Saturdays, but not Sundays. It just terminates here, uh, no, sorry, here at Clarendon Hill on Sundays. And so do the 89 and I think the 88. Um, this bus line is actually one of the most heavily used east-west corridor, bus corridors in the Boston area. And there are a ton of onboardings here in yellow. Uh, going down to Davis Square with the off warnings in blue, and a few more passengers going down to Lechmere. But that's an important regional link, uh, residents going uh, eastbound in the morning and then coming back to Arlington in the evening. There aren't many facilities for transit users. On the left, you can see there's a typical bus stop. It's just demarcated with a sign, but not really anything else. Meanwhile, just down the block on Mass Ave, there are all these different features. There's benches, there's shelters, sometimes there's drinking fountains. This is actually in um, Boston, but this is a bus and bike only lane uh, to get the buses to go right up to the front of the intersection and, and skip all the queues waiting at a red light. But these are some, some potential countermeasures, and not all of them require al uh, allocating space or taking it away from the sidewalk. Like a bench or a bus shelter is relatively easy to implement as a um, uh, contrast to a, a bus only lane. We have uh, one. Oh, on, on Mass Ave there is, on, in the mornings, in the peak direction of travel, but not, not on Broadway. One of our recommendations is, um, one of our uh, potential recommendations is looking at the possibility of a bus-only lane go approaching AOI Brook Parkway here. Uh, so we calculated there actually is room. The um, eastbound lane of Broadway here is 21 feet wide, so that could fit a 10-foot traffic lane and 11-foot bus only and bus only and bike lane. But that was one of the specific issues that we heard at this intersection. There's so much congestion coming eastbound in the morning uh, that it just makes it, it's just really difficult to exit Arlington into Somerville and it actually creates turning difficulties for all these residents living here in the north turning left onto Broadway. They have to wait several cycles of this intersection here in order to uh, able to work part in order to get through. We also heard in terms of other location specific issues, just look, uh, merging and visibility difficulties at that triangular Warren Street Broadway intersection, the same one that another resident described as a death trap. But the acute angle there just makes it very difficult to turn onto Broadway safely. And we even heard resident, oh, does this have a pointer? Yes. We heard some residents come down Warren Street and then turn right on Bates Road and then they make the 90 degree left because it's safer that way. Mm -hmm. um, but these are some of the location specific concerns here on the right. On the left are just the more general concerns. Um, residents, in all, in all the different ways we've reached out to them, they've said they would like safety issues and uh, bike safety issues, uh, pedestrian safety issues and bike safety issues addressed, uh, particularly crosswalks, and especially near the Gibbs School, which has just reopened, and some of those crosswalks have not yet been tailored to student traffic in the morning. I think the Transportation Advisory Committee has started looking at some of those issues, but not fully. Um, and, also, and this also relates to the uh, issue before of residents, up here, residents uh, desiring places nearby to go to safely just for daily uses, grabbing, grabbing coffee or getting groceries or meeting friends. 
These summarize our, all our different uh, mobility recommendations. Corridor wide, we'd like to advocate for bike lanes uh, in both directions on the corridor. And we have heard from residents posting them the, the question, um, what, would, what would you say if, we, if one lane of parking was taken away in one direction in order to make the space for this bike lane? And a lot of residents have said that that would be great to do along this corridor because parking is not heavily demanded along the entire corridor, only in certain places where there are businesses or where there's high density housing. So it is within the realm of feasibility, uh, possibly taking away a <coughs> lane of parking on Broadway to make space for bike lanes in each direction. We'd like to advocate for a safer walking routes to and from schools and uh, common uh, communal destinations such as grocery stores. Uh, better streetscape, more bus shelters, bus uh, benches for transit users, night lighting, more tree shading. Uh, and we, we don't know exactly what the means of reaching the MBTA politically are, but we'd like to advocate for Sunday service on the 87. There might be a potential in, in order uh, for the Overton window for that to open up to that because the, uh, the Green Line extension is going to change some of the services on the lines coming into coming out of uh, Somerville into Arlington. So might, there might be an opportunity there to advocate for the MBA to expand service on the 87. In terms of specific intersections, we'd like, uh, we're recommending a study of congestion at that Alewife Brook Parkway intersection, all of the issues of people trying to get eastbound in the morning. And we're, advoca we're advocating we're, um, for a redesign of the Warren Street, River Street intersection, the triangular one there on Broadway. Uh, to address safety for all, all different modes, for pedestrian issues on the, on the crosswalks, bike issues because there is no painted stripes to, uh, telling bicyclists how to get through that intersection, and also for vehicles because of the uh, visibility uh, and merging difficulties through the angle of that intersection. There's a lot of different things that can be done with that intersection. We looked at some uh, ambitions, ambitious ones, roundabout-ish, we were calling them, but we'd encourage uh, maybe an engineering design team to look at that more closely, but we do think uh, it would be great to take a look at redesigning that intersection in particular. That ends my uh, coverage of, of this presentation. I'll hand it over to Kendrick to discuss uh, <coughs> neighborhood character, and finally our site-specific uh, recommendation, or our focus sites. Thank you, Griffin. Um, so we're going to be going into the third and final focus area that the study has, um, I guess, pinpointed, and that's the neighborhood character of the corridor um, along Broadway. And so in speaking to residents through community engagement sessions and through outreach, um, one thing that has been emphasized was that um, Broadway already has its own specific character and they want to preserve that. They don't want to be um, a replicate of what the Massachusetts Avenue corridor is. And so um, through, I guess, street walks, we have seen that um, there are these like tree-lined tree streets and distinct housing facades that um, are specific to the neighborhood. And there are these neighborhood amenities that residents do like to frequent um, through just walking and um, sheer convenience. <clears throat> and as we go into the presentation further, we will address the Luciano Field. Um, but these are just a few of the assets that we have been, we have um, highlighted and that have come up through community engagement sessions. Um, on the other hand, in, uh, um, on the other hand to kind of like increase and um, uh, I guess enhance the streetscape of the corridor. There are these opportunities such as the vacant lot, um, as mentioned at the old Arlington automatic transition site. Um, and there are these large empty yards in front of apartments and buildings that don't necessarily contribute to the um, coherence of the streetscape. And so moving forward with um, the study's proposals, we do seek to enhance these um, opportunities that can uh, contribute to neighborhood street state. Um, and there are already existing activities that are happening along the corridor. Um, some recent ones include the recent developments of the Learn to Grow Daycare um, and the much beloved Duncan <laughs> um, as a community gathering space. Um, and then uh, moving forward, the 117 Broadway uh, development, which will 
um, reincorporate the pre-existing Arlington food pantry on the ground level floor, making room for um, affordable units and the commercial uh, ground level activity. Um, in addition to the streetscape, uh, something that residents deeply um, are passionate about is the proximity to green space that this area has access to. Um, and here we see that there are various recreational activities such as the Alewife Brook, um, the Crosby Park, uh, Luciana Field, and the Spy Pond Park. And to complement these recreational green spaces, there are the non-recreational sites such as the uh, St. Paul Cemetery and the aforementioned um, triangle over at the Broadway and Warren Street intersection. Um, however, there are uh, associated environmental challenges um, to these green spaces. And so any proposals that we are um, mentioning moving forward, uh, they should seek to address these environmental challenges, um, such as the flooding along the brook, the urban heat island effect, and stormwater contamination. The last two of the urban heat island and stormwater con contamination are the um, most pressing, pressing issues along the corridor. And the um, design proposals that we mentioned um, stress that uh, they should de decrease the amount of impermeable surfaces um, <coughs> and increase the tree canopy um, within the site. And so, Moving forward, residents have said that they would like the corridor to reflect um, more of the Arlington Center vibe to be brought down the street. And so um, that's something that we, I guess, um, incorporate into the proposals moving forward. And so just summarizing the neighborhood character recommendations, we have three themes that are guiding us. We seek to um, transition the corridor from grab and go to come and stay. And we accomplish that by activating the ground floor of the streetscape, um, by encouraging more street um, frontage <coughs> accesses. Um, also, we do suggest the activation, um, however temporary that may be through activities such as um, street festivals or through design proposals such as parklets. Um, and moving forward to address the um, already existing green spaces that the uh, corridor has tremendous access to, we seek to activate Luciano Field um, and really seek to open it up um, to the community. And finally, we seek to preserve the neighborhood environment um, by once again preserving and expanding the tree canopy um, along the corridor. So moving forward to our specific focus sites, um, we targeted the Luciano Field, um, the Leahy site, and the third um, Focus site is the Broadway streetscape as a whole. Um, and so our understanding of the design proposals we are mentioning here come from this process of um, first understanding the site uh, through the outreach and research field visits that we've been conducting since September, um, and moving on to the in-class work we've been conducting um, that blended the um, research, outreach, and field visits with um, design principles um, seen here through um, iterations of design charrettes. Um, and then finally, we uh, came up with concept designs that we will go um, into more later in the presentation. And so for Luciano Field, the understanding of the site um, came through uh, highlighting the tremendous assets that the park already has, such as the neighborhood splash pad and the playground that we'll seek to get updated in the future. Um, and the street visits were particularly helpful for us because um, during our initial visits, it was hard to ascertain that the field actually existed. 
Um, and so <clears throat> it was hard to realize that the field existed because there's no park access from Broadway. Um, and so that's something that we um, seek to, uh, uh, I guess, like incorporate into our proposals. And so this is one possible um, proposal that we came up with, where you can see this is Broadway, um, and there's Luciano, and these are the uh, side streets. And these lines represent possible pedestrian flows that can open up the park from Broadway. And there's a blend of, um, I guess, public uses that can be incorporated through passing, in addition to a community center, commercial use, and um, residential units into the sites. And here's a um, front-facing view from Broadway, where the bottom level of the proposal has um, commercial activity, um, as well as a community space here. And the upper levels um, make provisions for um, increased residential units. And so this blends our um, three focus areas of housing, um, where we seek to increase the number of units, and uh, mobility, where we seek to make the corridor more pedestrian friendly, and um, neighborhood character, where we seek to um, really provide a space for the community to gather. Um, and this is a side view from the side streets, where here's Luciano Field and um, Broadway, <coughs> and the uh, street facing opposite Broadway, where the proposal really um, seeks to open up the street to the community so that um, Luciano's programming can really benefit the community um, moving forward. And there are precedents for something um, of this, uh, I guess, magnitude. Um, so the inspiration for this came from, a, from Bustamante Park in Santiago, Chile, um, where the development blended a library, a cafe, and a restaurant um, that opened um, the street uh, up to the community. So um, we would like to envision something like this along Broadway. And the next focus site that we highlight um, is the Leahy Building. And so our understanding of the site um, was that there's this large parking lot um, and the opposite facing commercial and industrial um, uses that don't really contribute much to the neighborhood character or feel of the corridor. And so this is one possible iteration that we um, came up with where we make, well, yeah, this is to kind of orient you where this is Broadway, the cemetery, and um, the design proposal. Um, and so more specifically, this proposal once again blends the focus areas that we've been discussing through this presentation. Um, by blending the ground level activation through mixed use retail um, and increasing the number of residential units both above and making provisions for row houses behind. And this um, particular design um, seeks to tear down so as to respect um, already residential units that are um, along Silk Street and in the rear of the corridor. And as for the flow of traffic, here represented with the uh, purple lines is one possible way to address the congestion Griffin mentioned earlier, um, where this side street would be one way and um, it would go out towards Broadway with um, a possible new traffic signal here um, in order to once again relieve some of that congestion. Um, no, with full recognition that there is a traffic light, um, I guess, uh, by the Brook Parkway. So that's why we um, made that provision here. And this is um, just a current image of um, Broadway as it is um, through the street. And here it is um, from a different angle. And so in order to address the um, streetscape, 
we proposed this um, design uh, where there's some bike lanes and um, driving lanes with uh, full provision for the public um, in addition to um, these more open and pedestrian friendly uses for the street. Um, and so thank you for listening to the presentation and we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Sure, we'll start with questions from the board and then move on to the folks in the audience. Anyone? Um, well, when you guys looked at uh, some of these recommendations, I think they are uh, great recommendations. Thank you for the work, okay? Except for when you put all of them together, okay, they seem to lack a balance. You, there's no um, um, trade off because you say, okay, let's take away some parking so we can have a safer bike lane. But then you encourage um, uh, multifamily and you tell below that means that that means you need more parking. So it's one or the other. Uh, is there a balance between the two that you guys looked into? Uh, I'm not saying, you know, I'm just trying to see if this uh, was you guys looked that far into looking at all the good recommendations you have and, and a balance of the two because you can't have all. I don't think. And if you can, then I like I, I'd be great. Please tell me. Um, some of the other things uh, I like what you did with uh, Leahy Field, where you uh, brought the field through back to Broadway. But then, what you've done then now is put the cars below grade, and you added ho um, housing above and and put retail down below, in in sort of pods and having a filtering system to go th connect to Broadway and Park. But th that's all one uh, massive project that's done in one project there. There's got to be four or five owners there. Have we thought of doing this incrementally or, or, or a way of having that same goal but doing it in th so it organically grows as opposed to saying here's a big master vision and let's take over three, three blocks and this is what we got to do. It, it, that, to me, doesn't seem as realistic as looking at it in a way of saying, here's some ideas, and these are great ideas, but we can slowly grow it here organically, and, and it'll develop to this way here. Or here's, by triggering this thing here, it'll sponsor other things, and it'll just grow this way. I'm just wondering if you guys think of that kind of stuff when you look at this. Yeah, it's a good point. I, it's fair to say we did s stretch the logistical feasibility of some of these designs. That's okay, you're in school. But, school is fine. Yeah, but <laughs> that's great. We, we were in our minds, we were balancing the logistical realities like the zoning and real estate realities of how development occurs and the need to present a vision to like prompt uh, something necessary to happen on Broadway. We decided. We wanted to go with the angle of providing something that may not be exactly how it might play out uh, line by line in, in the future, but we wanted to present some sort of vision of what might be possible. You know, although it is it is true to acknowledge it's the um, those projects that assemble all the different parcels at the same time for a bigger project are hard to do because it's hard to get all the landlords to line up and be willing to con to contribute their land. We know, for example, the um, the landowner of the uh, abandoned auto transmission shop, uh, he's been, uh, there have been some difficulties between the town in, and him and also proposed developers, developers interested in the site in, in creating some project there. And so there are some landlord specific issues with every site. Um, but we, we still wanted to present something visionary and, and inspiring. You've done that and it's very good, remarkable. Right. Just that. Yes. Uh, in terms of practicality, you actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. This is Augie. Augie. Uh, yeah. uh, in terms of practicality, you actually met with developers and spoke to them and actually understood the conditions of the lots and what might be possible, what might not be possible. We met with the owner of the Lakey building also to talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did some initial research of 
where and how things stand. Now from there on, of course, a lot of these things need some time and some vision to happen like in the way that we, we presented them. But we did some groundwork also. And you can mention about the um, different uses of parking on the street in front of the All right. uh, buildings. Right. Yeah. Regarding the, the first comment you had uh, about um, it is a fair point. There is a conflict, the conflicting needs between dens densifying the corridor, allowing more people to live in the area, versus the constraint of allowing parking, and whether uh, the parking can be provided, but also space can be provided for bicyclists. One uh, one strategy we rec we're recommending in our report, we didn't happen to feature in, in this presentation, but we're recommending in the report just to uh, mitigate that a little bit, is uh, strategizing which land uses might be better for uh, taking away that one lane of parking than others. For example, it should be preserved in front of commercial uses as we have in just a slide previously. Here we happen to show parking lanes on both sides because this would be a retail destination. And in front of uh, institutions, um, it would be important to preserve those. But from the cemetery, there doesn't really need to be a parking lane there. Um, and in front of some of the uh, three-story homes, uh, parking is needed for guests but it's not exactly one parking spot that's needed for every home so there is room maybe to give one dedicated parking spot uh, for three or four homes we're not exactly sure what the legal means of doing that are with parking uh, regulations but this is still just a, a visionary yeah. approach mm -hmm. uh, i do know your uh, point about uh, from the cemetery i drive by that every day that's how i go to work <laughs> and um, you need those two lanes even though it's not a legal lane, you still need that lane because if someone's taking a left, you're stuck there. And the, the queuing goes way beyond Leahy right. in the morning mm -hmm. because if something you can't make those turns. So sometimes you you got to get on the right-hand lane, which is, I'm not sure is, a, is it a legal lane or not, but everybody uses it. And they start queuing up on that side from Leahy on, on a, a whole, across the whole, uh, right. and that whole traffic situation is terrible. Right. You know, even if you want to take a left-hand turn onto Broadway, it's next to impossible because you have to cut somebody off or you have to wait for one light second per car. Yeah. But that, that, that's potentially solvable through looking more carefully at the signalization because we saw the improvements that happened at Mass Ave and L.A. for Parkway from, uh, from rejiggering the signalization as, as part of, uh, of mm -hmm. the recent projects. There. That was adding lanes, though, too. Well, it was repurposing the lanes, yeah, configuring the yeah, lanes, yeah. and changing the signals. Yeah, but yeah, so. but yeah, yeah I, um, I see your points, and I like your points. I'm just saying, I just want to add a twist to it. You know, right. saying, uh, I think you've done a great job, and and I really commend you for taking a look at part of Arlington that is not often thought of in these discussions. And I appreciate that you talked with. <clears throat> every group of stakeholders that you possibly could, um, and that you took into consideration environmental issues and sustainability issues, and really gave us something to, to think about when it comes to all of these various issues that um, a lot of the time we have a tendency to kind of get stuck into our own minds, and so I appreciate the fact that you've come out uh, with this project, which it doesn't have to be practical, which is kind of the beauty of it. It, it can be as aspirational as you want it to be, and I think you've done a great job with that. Um, I'm really impressed by the idea of opening up Luciano Field, and I would love to see if there's a way that we can sort of encourage that to happen in the future, even if it's with uh, occasional programming with some of the non-redevelopment board associated uh, groups in town. I know there are some representatives of them in the room tonight. It's a conversation worth having. Um, really interesting work. Good job. And, and I look forward to digging into it a little bit more seeing what ideas we can come up with moving on. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I appreciate the amount of work you got done. I, I realize how challenging that is within the context of a class semester. Mm -hmm. uh, I particularly appreciate um, the amount of public engagement that you did and, and the range of different public engagement activities mm -hmm. that you conducted. Um, and. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that your results were were surprising overall um, uh, from from the public comments, with the possible exception of uh, receptiveness to parking removal, 
um, which I would certainly like to explore more. Um, but thank you. I don't really have anything to add, I, I, other than maybe to say, I don't think these things are infeasible as little chunks of things individually. I think the challenge for the town will be to take what your final report is and say, what do we like and how can we take what we like and make it happen over some period of time with, as David says, a lot of community input into the process. So I think this is a good building block for where the town is going to need to go. I just have a, a question for, for you. Um, I appreciate, again, all of the, the comments that my colleagues have made here. And um, I also want to echo the fact that I think it's wonderful that you found an opportunity to include so many different stakeholders and, and um, so much public input. Um, my question is whether it was from the public work session that you put together or your own work sessions in your class, what were some of, um, or w was there a, you know, to your point of, you know, I don't think anything is particularly surprising here. Was there anything that came up, an idea, whether it was from the work session or from your class, that was very aspirational, perhaps something that was deemed too infeasible, but was something that was kind of interesting that didn't make it into your final report that you want to share with us. Right. I, I will turn to my team members to ask if they remember some of those. I, I know there was one... I think somebody has something you really yeah. want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go before mine. I think because we were talking about that, and it didn't make it into the presentation, but the war on intersection the, was the third mm -hmm. site that we were looking at, and we actually decided to leave it out for now because it requires more traffic uh, analysis mm -hmm. and, and, and other things, but we really think something can be done there. It's, it's very bad design and it can open up a place for public space and it can open up <coughs> a lot of options if you look at that place. And we might actually include something of that in the final report. Right. Can I have one other, which is yeah. partially already in there, but we did a yeah. two hour work design session. We came up with this idea of the Luciano field of having a kind of overlook on Broadway that would then look out mm -hmm. over the park and we, we kind of thought, oh, what a great idea. And then that night we went to the Thompson Elementary School parent-teacher organization and a parent just proposed that exact idea, <laughs> right? I mean, it was just, it was in the air for, yeah. you have a great change, you could look out over the field. She was saying she could, you know, drink coffee while our kids were playing games. So it That's was a dream. It was yeah. aspiration or not. There's a lot of potential to have a great park street connection that yeah. I thought was cool that people came at that from different experiences. Yeah. It was great. It's always the underdeveloped asset in this Great, thank you. I, I really enjoy hearing, um, again, what, what didn't make it into the page. Sometimes there's a nugget in there that's good for us to hear, so thank you. Okay. I'll let you folks call on people in the crowd if you want to have them give some input. <laughs> Um, first, I, I agree uh, with, I think Andrew, you said it, and others as well, that I love that you brought us a vision because I think Arlington gets uh, bogged down into just discussing, sort of nibbling around the edges of what is already there and incremental changes here and there. So it's wonderful to have a vision. When I read this, I was blown away by one or maybe two specific statistics, and that is the, that in this area, 34% of the housing units are occupied by a single person. I think one of the things we think about when we think about Arlington is that it's a town of families. And clearly, in the, it's not. And, and when you add on the number of housing units that are occupied by two people, it, it takes it up to 71% of the area. So I would love for you to come back with a vision uh, and tell us, first of all, are those like old people after they've had their family? Or are they young people before they've had their family? Or an equal combination of each? I mean, who, what age group, and, and therefore hypothesizing what are their needs? And secondly, it, does that represent a real demand in housing that people may be living in inappropriate housing units, and if we were to build more housing units, should they be for that population in that area? <laughs> That's, a, that's an outstandingly helpful comment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank well, you. We should look into that. So, so even though I'm letting these, these folks uh, do the Q&A, 
as usual with public comment, public hearing. Just state your name and address so we can. Oh, have sorry. Uh, that's okay. Barbara Thornton, uh, two two three Park Ave. Precinct 16. Yeah, and that's so that you get appropriate credit 10 years from now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Leo McHugh, I own a, a taxi business in Arlington. Arlington, Arlington taxi. I'm licensed out of the town of Arlington. Um, if you go down Broadway, and you know, do you know where Gardner Street is? Gardner Street, yes. Yes, okay. If you go down Gardner Street, towards Decatur Street, there's a section down the end there that nobody, ha it has never been resurfaced. You can get down there tonight and there's potholes all over the place and it's like a war zone. And for some reason or another, from Decatur Street up Gardner to maybe Fremont Street, it's mostly down the uh, Decatur Street end. There's a section for years for some reason or another, it does not get resurfaced. So everybody <coughs> avoids Gardner Street because it's like, a, you know, it's all potholes. So there are, I would say, hundreds of cars. If you fix that section, they would, um, you'd get a lot more use and that would greatly help the traffic on Gardner Street because everybody avoids it. Right. We should, we should put that in. Yeah. We've been in touch with the, the Transportation Advisory Committee. <laughs> and I think, although I'm not that experienced in this, I think that's within their purview is repaving. Is that correct? That might be a private road. It's a, it's oh, a private it might way, actually. Oh, private way. But, but how, why is that a off. private road? Why is that section? I mean, it's, why is that section a private road? <laughs> That's, that's, uh, that's, that's not for these guys to answer. <laughs> 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 but does anybody agree that it's a, a big problem? I mean, it's an it eyesore. A, what? It's an eyesore among other. Even well, if you don't go down it, yeah. But I think it has a huge effect. Nobody uses it. They go all around. They, that's why you have a lot of people going down Broadway and taking a left up on the Parkway because they don't want to get down Cardinal Street. Yeah. It would be interesting if it was a private road that was still open to public roadways on both ends. Mm -hmm. So that we should. The uh, although it's out of the, our yeah, the issue of private roads in Arlington is confusing, <laughs> long-standing, <laughs> not one that this board has the authority or power to change. Fortunately. Is, is that yeah. Hi, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. I live just outside of your, your study area. I really wasn't surprised at that 34% figure for single households. Remembering that most of the structures in your area are two-family homes, the first floor of which are, are two-bedroom units. They're probably the most affordable housing units in the town. So if you're looking to rent, there aren't that many one-bedroom places to rent in town. Or buy if you're looking for a small condo. That's a lot of to go up towards. Um, I had a, a couple, well, first a comment. I think your figure for the uh, number of affordable units is way low in the town. That might be the number of units that the Housing Corporation of Arlington has. It's not the number of units the, uh, that have been created by the inclusionary zoning bylaw. It's certainly number, not the number of units of the Arlington Housing Authority. Um, you, so I would, I would look into that. You, that, right. that number is much higher. But I was, I was curious um, about one thing when you show the development around Elwhite Brook and uh, um, Sunnyside Ave. Are those um, five-story buildings, the taller ones? Oh, uh, right. And, yes. and are they allowed under existing zoning, or is that something that would require a zoning change? It varies site by site. I th one of these buildings right here along Sunnyside Avenue, I think already is uh, four or five stories. I can't remember. But each of these parcels has a different land use type in the, in the zoning code. Uh, one of Part of our proposal is just uh, aggregating that and just making the zoning at that spot a little bit more logical but uh, I don't this would not this entire site would not be feasible under the current zoning regime except maybe for the maybe the townhouses and part of this building yeah. and then just one other um, question you I think you said that you thought the bicycle usage on Broadway was equal to that on Mass Ave and the bike path. I'm wondering where where those numbers came from. What's the basis for that statement? The 
the only data that we could look at was the, the Strava data, and there m might be some bias with that because uh, the athletic and recreational users are a little bit more aggressive bike users, uh, so they might be more willing to take a broad way than other normal bicyclists. The other data set was the line bike data. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why the line uh, trips would be as um, inaccurately frequent on Broadway since uh, line trips might be users without a bike of their own or short trips. Um, but those are the only data sets we have. And the line one, we couldn't actually get specific figures from due to proprietary pro proprietary limits associated with Lyme and the town. So we, we are admittedly limited in the quantitative information that we have about the bike traffic along the corridor. And in fact, it might be, it might not be in entirely accurate of us to, to estimate a single number because bike traffic varies so much throughout the week, throughout the year. Um, but we just had to do, we had to look at some data. So we used those two data sets and we, we had to draw a conclusion from that. But it is true, it's not the most accurate. Those are not the most accurate figures. Thanks. It doesn't, as someone who lives between the two corridors, I would say the bike path in Mass Ave probably gets a lot more bike traffic in total than, um, than Broadway does. This is my, my unscientific observation. Mm -hmm. Yes? Thank you. I just want to emphasize what Mr. Boretti said. That I loved your presentation, by the way. I think the idea of um, accessing the park from Broadway is long overdue. But um, the need for affordable housing in the entire metropolitan area is very great. However, your numbers are not accurate, unfortunately, for Arlington. We have over a thousand subsidized affordable units, and we have probably several, several thousand um, naturally affordable um, housing units, or very close to the HUD guidelines, um, which actually would be greatly endangered by dense construction because um, it would be an incentive for developers to demolish a lot of those with a lot of what's happening, as you well know, eviction and displacement. And it would be a tragedy for Arlington. There's no way that we could deal with the tsunami of evictions and displacements in a uh, developer-heavy um, uh, zoning change if that would occur to density. We w it would be a tragedy. Thank you. We, sh we should keep that in mind. We should bear in mind the effects and potential of evictions, uh, gentrification in our housing section, housing section in our housing recommendations. Did you have something to add? We are not proposing a rezoning of the total. Not, not of the total. Yeah. Only of the two sides that there are no. Yes. Hi, Beth Malovchuk. I'm sorry, I came in late, so I just have a practical question. Is this presentation available to the public? Yes, I think we um, we actually we received the presentation this afternoon, and we are we posted it I think to the agenda, mm -hmm. and then also to the news item, which is on the redevelopment board page. Mm -hmm. So there's a so at the top of the page. Okay, it's so wonderful. right now it's on the agenda, and what and, the, and, the, the, and the website. There are two locations. One's on the agenda, and then the other <coughs> one is on the <coughs> redevelopment board page. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. Will the written report be available to the public? Certainly. And same, how, how would that be made available? Same way, public? yeah. And and we will probably do a news notice, like we do a town notice when we, you know, when something like that is completed. And would so it be edited, or would it be? Um, I think it. We'll we'll receive it at some point soon. Um, I mean, would does does planning edit it, or would we actually oh, get to no, see it? No, it would it would be the report from the students that we receive from the Fantastic. students. Fantastic! I look forward to reading it. Thank Thank you. you. I I did participate in some of the. Um, in four sessions, and I was very gratified. Very gratified. Thank you. Here's a printed copy of the presentation. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, my name is Mara Vats. I live at 77 Warren Street, just outside of the Broadway corridor. Um, and I'm curious if you guys thought about communicating with Somerville, and maybe this is more a question for you, because to solve the traffic at that intersection, the problem that I see is that you have two lanes in Arlington merging into one lane in the middle of the intersection. It's two lanes in Arlington and it's one lane in Somerville and it's also like a bus turnaround and a crosswalk and it's, it's horrible. 
I used to have to drive my daughter that way for preschool, and it would take me, I don't know, 25 minutes to get basically into Teal Square, which is, you know, two miles away. Um, so to fix that intersection, you can do whatever you want on the Arlington side, but if it's not in coordination with Somerville, mm -hmm. um, it's not going to ease that. So I don't know if there's a, a plan mm -hmm. to do that or like who has jurisdiction over the intersection? The town manager's <coughs> office has actually just initiated some conversations with the mayor's office and their planning department, the peer department, um, to start those conversations and really talk about ways to address some of the issues that were raised tonight and then other issues that are that continue along in Somerville for that bus in particular, but also for bicyclists and others in the in that connect in connection of the roadway. Right. And my the second the question end. was, um, did you guys have the time or a chance to consider how the Green Line extension is going to change that part of Arlington since it's going to be, that's going to offer another way to get into Kendall, which is where I think a lot of people in East Arlington are going. Right. We did. We did reach out to the MBTA. I used some of my strategic connections to try to find someone associated with the Better Bus Project mm -hmm. uh, to give me information about how the, all the different bus lines coming from Somerville into Arlington might be changed as a result of the Green Line extension. And the clear answer they gave me was they, they do not know yet. They're waiting for the Green Line extension to open, and then they're going to look at the changes <coughs> And I assume that's going to come with a uh, public outreach process, a uh, feedback process. But then they're, then they're going to use that opportunity to change the buses. We think that would provide an opening for uh, implementing some of the changes we're advocating for on the 87. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like the MBTA is just waiting to see how the cards may fall before deciding. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and also related to the Alewife Parkway intersection, to make matters even more confusing, there's also that intersection may be under some jurisdiction by the DCR, Department yeah. of mm -hmm. Conservation and Recreation, because right. they control the parkway. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. Yes. I have one question and one suggestion. The question is, um, in follow-up to um, Mrs. Wharton's question or comment, are there um, Arlington Housing Authority developments in the, in the area that you described? There are, isn't there? The yeah, the yeah, yeah, And how many units are then in that, do you know? Three one court? It's a big, uh, how big many place. hundred? It's a big place. It's a big, it's about a hundred units? Yeah, it goes so. from uh, mm -hmm. Fremont Court, I mean Fremont Street, you take a left out to Fremont Court, you can go all the way in, and turn it around, it's like a, you go around, there's a lot of units in there. There's mm -hmm. right on the side of the buildings, they have the number of units. Okay. And it's pretty high. Thanks. And the other, the other uh, suggestion I have is that Arlington is like doubly blessed by MIT in the last few days. Last week, uh, Christoph Reinhardt came and paid a visit here. And he is the head of the, I don't know, remember which lab he is, but he is in the School of Architecture uh, and works with DUSP. And, and he is big on daylighting and building and has a di drawings just like that. I found his uh, proposals and ideas to be very exciting, and I can send you a link because we recorded them for on video. So he's got he's run a lot of data. Great. I just want to thank Jeff Levine and Victoria Evelina and all of the other members of the class team for all of their work this evening. It's been a real pleasure to be able to work with all of you for the semester. I know you still have some more work to do. Of course, we're going to follow up and thank the board for the great, great questions and, of course, other folks from the audience. So I just want to say thank you. We want to thank the, the planning community development Aaron. department. It's been really great working <laughs> with you guys. At all. So great, great clients. So really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome. We love our instructors. <laughs> Can I ask you one, one oh, quick question? Oh. Just okay. uh, when you were interviewing the people there and uh, when they were talking about the cemetery, did they view that cemetery as a park or, a, 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 or, or an open space or a green space? It, how, did he, how did people view that? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. There, 
anytime uh, when we were tabling, anytime we asked someone about the, the cemetery, their reaction was sort of, what? Oh yeah, that cemetery. They don't really seem to notice it, I guess. Um, either because of the way it's easily hid on a, behind the row of trees, or people don't go there that often. But we never really encountered any way that people engage with the cemetery. We didn't meet anyone who said they, they walked very good. Oh, yeah. is it? I, I would just differ slightly and say that some people did walk through the cemetery, sort of passively. It is a nice, mm -hmm. like, green area, but um, that was relatively unusual. Mm -hmm. amongst. Most people just didn't mention it or didn't visit it. It's owned by Catholic Chairman. Right, a St. Mm -hmm. Paul's. Yeah. Now, I have been you know, I have um, bought a residence there. <laughs> uh. In other words, uh, when we go, we'll be going <laughs> there. <laughs> I mean, we have a cemetery lot. I don't want my kids hunting around for a cemetery. I come from Scotland. And um, so we we bought a, a, a lot in a cemetery. This is widely used by people who have no other place to go when they go. Is there a large Catholic population in Arlington? I hope so. I'm one yes. of them. <laughs> <laughs> The green, the green Line extension, the uh, it's going to end. Uh, they're going to drop people off at the corner of Boston Ave and College Ave. If you're wondering where the where they're going to drop, people can get on and get off, and that's the last stop. Right. And it's in Medford. Right. That's the one near Tufts University. Right. But it's uh, it's going to this, the stop is going to be at the corner of College Ave and Boston Ave. Right, yeah. That's where the stop's going to be. Yes, sorry. Um, I was wondering about uh, the North Union playground, or Usam Fields, that's what you're referring to, yeah, right. um, and opening up to Broadway. Do you have any insight or any numbers as to who actually uses the park, whether it's people from the other side of Broadway? Um, I just sort of have the impression that Broadway is kind of a natural divider and the people who live on the south side of Broadway probably use other playgrounds on that side rather than crossing them over. Because there is, there is easy access to the playground from the north side of Broadway to the residential neighborhood there. And I'm just wondering, what is the rationale for wanting to open it up to Broadway itself? Right. I, if any members of my team have more information on what were our findings on who uses the park? Um, I don't think we asked uh, necessarily where people lived, um, it, but the park was sort of the most beloved asset of the Broadway neighborhood from everybody we spoke to, um, everybody that lived in the neighborhood generally in the study mm -hmm. area, um, you know, had either spoken fondly of it, having gone to school um, at uh, Thompson. Yeah, at Thompson, um, you know, had kids sort of engage in sports or use the sledding hill at Luciano or the splash pad. Um, so I, we don't have a good sense of if they were crossing Broadway itself, um, but it was sort of um, one of those pieces of the neighborhood that caused people to light up and speak really enthusiastically and I think for that reason because we perceived it as an asset and um, you know I think Griffin mentioned what the first time we visited the site uh, we were walking down Broadway and weren't aware that the park was there we walked right past it didn't realize that there was anything um, mm -hmm. you know hidden behind the Dunkin Donuts well, or the well, some garage. people would see that as an advantage to have the park well buffered from a, a busy um, commercial corridor. Um, you know, I'm, I really don't know. I'm just sort of uh, playing the devil's advocate here and saying that maybe having it buffered from Broadway is a good thing. Um, and it doesn't really infect access to the park because uh, there's that whole other neighborhood on the north side of Broadway and it's very easy access on lightly traveled roads for mm -hmm. people to get there. One thing I think you're definitely putting your feeder, by the way, members of the team, you definitely put your finger on crossing Broadway can be intimidating for a lot of people. We were talking with their kids' uses on both sides of the street, the dance center, the Ellis School on the southern side, and then the daycare and the top school on the other side. So part of our recommendations are also to make it 
easier and more comfortable to cross the road. Um, so I, I don't think you're inaccurate in saying right now some people find it intimidating and intimidating for their kids to cross. And some of our suggestions are to make it a little more inviting to go back and forth across the road. I would add one more comment, which I think maybe came from you, Mara. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, there is, there are sort of some access issues on the side streets of Luciano Field. Um, there's a lot of traffic going to and from Thompson School, and so we didn't talk about them in the presentation, but there are sort of these hot spots where there's maybe unsafe intersections or a lot of traffic um, across those streets going into Luciano Field. So. Um, the access to the park uh, might be a little bit more, a um, little bit easier on the side streets, but um, there's a little work to be done there also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in particular in the morning at drop off, you've got the sidewalk on Everett Street that kids are trying to get to the path that leads to the school, and you basically have to make. Mm -hmm. Um, a U-turn from the street to get up onto the sidewalk and when you're mixing strollers, scooters, mm -hmm. bikes, um, walking, car doors opening, it's really, uh, it, could, it could use a different curb cut. Mm -hmm. That could be like a very simple solution to that, that cluster if you're ever there at 8, 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the Everett side. Um, and, and in general, the, um, the athletic part of the field is not accessible by any ADA standards. Um, and the entrances to the fields are kind of these like falling apart staircases in the middle. So those are little improvements that can make a big difference. Just to make sure we properly introduce you, this is Mary and Hannah Smith, one of our team members. I just wanted to add something. Yes. Oh, this is Paolo, another team yeah, uh, uh, when we uh, thought about this proposal in Luciano Field, uh, we came with up this idea of opening it uh, to Broadway, uh, thinking of how to bring uh, more more vib how do you say? vibrancy vibrancy to bro to the Broadway corridor. Using the park, we thought it was a very good uh, thing to do. Uh, we opened like it. Catalyst, yeah. Yeah, it, it'll promote other things to gather people there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To right in the middle yes. of mm -hmm. the Broadway corridor of the area of study. So we thought it was a good idea. Of course, these are just proposals. Things that come to our mind. Mm -hmm. I think that I think what students kept coming back to is that there was what we heard a lot is that there is no place like they're there to go, like the way you have on Mass Ave. And so the, that the activation of the front part along Broadway near the park could be that opportunity for placemaking and creating a place where people can gather in the community and create a set of amenities that are focused on people that live within, within the Broadway corridor. So it was in response to the three set goals. There were, you know, we maybe had 10, we started out with 10 goals and then narrowed down through conversation. So all of these proposals are built on the three set goals that were outlined in this presentation. So yes, there are a lot of other issues and concerns that um, could could be addressed if we had a year. <laughs> and maybe come back and do it again next fall. Um, but it was definitely based on just some of the most heard feedback, which is where people felt like there could be more than just one mode that is addressed along Broadway, which is currently just for the vehicles. And so can this be a place for people that live and maybe can just walk to some of the things that they'd like to see in their neighborhood? Let's wrap up. With yeah, I'm just curious. In this area, you know, there's there's multiple property owners, but Leahy is the, the big one. I'm curious whether you spoke to any of those uh, owners to get their perspective on redevelopment and why they're not pursuing more intensive development now. We spoke with the uh, owner of the lady You did. And she said she was open to redevelopment as long as there's a point to change, first of all. And second, uh, one of the lots is actually on sale. I think it is either, either sold recently or on sale, yeah. Uh, but we had this conversation of what is possible, what is not, and yeah, one of her. Uh, 
zoning currently doesn't allow for it. Sorry. The zoning currently doesn't allow for it, so a change in zoning would actually allow some of that to happen. <coughs> <coughs> we don't want to take any more. Well, no, I, and I, I want to thank you all again for, for the work that you've done. Um, I have a feeling that these conversations will continue. I think you've given us a lot to think about and to work with the department on and to continue to uh, <coughs> talk to the folks in the neighborhood there, see how they may want to see things develop naturally over time. So I really do appreciate it. Thank you for coming out tonight. And thanks for everyone who, who came to ask questions as well. It's, it's a good conversation to have. I, I hope it continues. So thank you all. We're glad to be here. Thank you. All right. So Jenny, um, moving on real quick, we have. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, we have two members of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee who are here tonight: Patricia and Karen. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then three of us attend those meetings so we can give a. Yeah, so quick I'll have Karen and, and Patricia come up um, quickly. Uh, you know, I personally haven't had a, a lot of time to, to dig into yep. uh, the materials that were provided over the weekend, but I'm, I'm very interested in this. So, kind of give us the, the quick the overview. The thumbnail of is that the, the housing plan. And how it will be implemented. The well Housing Plan sure. Implementation Committee is really focused on implementing the housing production plan. That's, mm -hmm. that's the most important thing. Um, <laughs> so, it is really about housing production, but we have been focusing on a lot of things that are related to not zoning issues and other sort of programmatic elements. I think during the summer we've had somewhat of a, a spotty meeting attendance, but, oh, sorry. So this is a suggestion that I know has come so, um, up a lot in our zoning discussions, and I'm, I'm really interested in the mechanics of it, how it would operate, how it would be implemented, and how <coughs> funds set aside and that would be used. So the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund is something that the town attempted to adopt um, in years back at a prior town meeting. Um, we've also had some conversations with, with Doug Heim. He actually attended the last Housing Plan Implementation Committee meeting. He's promised us and, and will at some point deliver us with a, a sort of a memo outlining the sort of ways in which we might be able to design one of these. Mm -hmm. It really would be under the purview of the select board, and so some of the next steps will really involve that. I think what the, we really wanted to do is just update you on that those more recent activities, and that's really the one primary mm -hmm. proposal that <coughs> we've been talking about, as well as a real estate transfer tax, and we don't have information about that here tonight to talk about, but. Um, those are just the two main things that the group has been discussing. Mm -hmm. I'll actually see if, Erin, do you want to add anything, and then Patricia, because I know Patricia's been attending all the meetings. Um, yeah, so I think that, sorry, I didn't want to walk in front of the table, <laughs> um, but I think that um, there's uh, interest from the committee to move forward on this, um, improve upon what was presented um, a number of years ago and um, see if there's a way to um, combine it with um, potentially the, the idea of a real estate transfer fee so that that can provide the seed money into the trust which um, at this point there's there is limited ways to fund the trust um, whether it's uh, uh, through the CPA or some other funding source, but it seemed like a natural um, combination at this time, and uh, it seemed like there was enough interest from the committee to pursue this and um, you know bring it bring it up um, for town meeting. Um, we, as Jenny had mentioned, we are awaiting some additional information from the from town council um, on ways to uh, format the different articles, warrant articles that might have to go along with this, but I think that um, there could be some movement on this. Um, so uh, I, I would be interested to hear the opinions of the ARB members after hearing from the other committee members. Is this something that would be ready for spring 2020? We were or? thinking of spring town meeting, and um, so this is really just to see if the, the redevelopment board would be, you know, if you're supportive, if you, you know, as Erin has noted, there are questions. I just want to also see if Patricia had anything to add to this because she's been attending these meetings. Do you have anything to add? Uh, well, just that um, about I the municipal affordable um, housing trust fund. Uh, I think it, it would be very beneficial for the town to have such a, a trust fund because some of the enabling legislation for various um, um, 
you know, contributions to affordable housing require that the funds be deposited in an affordable housing trust fund so that we could not accept them if we didn't have such a trust fund already in town. That's why I think it's important to give um, maximum possibility for um, building some financial capability as regards affordable housing to have this trust fund. Thank you. Is this a missed opportunity that we're looking at correcting here? It's not necessarily a missed opportunity, no. But if we're talking about the real estate transfer tax, you have to deposit in, so if that also was passed mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. through a special legislation, I might add. Um, so there's a lot of this in there, <laughs> but it, it has to be deposited into specifically a municipal affordable housing trust fund. It can't just be into the town's general operating fund. It has to go to a specific place as per the way that that is written. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's one reason. I guess the other thing is, I mean, there are potential opportunities for ways to utilize Community Preservation Act money, other resources that the town receives, and depositing them into that sort of account allows for the town to be a little bit more flexible and have a little more ability to act upon opportunities when they arise, um, whether it's for rental renter protections to home home ownership opportunities to development. So there's a lot of different mechanisms in order to uh, utilize those funds. How much of a tax are we talking about? Well, I, that's not, we're, we, we actually haven't talked about anything specific to that particular proposal yet. We're not, we're not okay. talking about the real estate transfer tax with this right now. We just wanted to talk with you about the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. So I don't, I don't have a specific proposal to share about the real estate well, transfer um, tax. If I could just say that, oh, yes. um, as we discussed in our meeting, yeah. um, we would uh, be working to produce uh, an instrument that was consistent with the, uh, that was possibly almost the exact um, chapter 55C of the Baton, um, but with a few little tweaks, maybe requiring um, town meeting approval here and there, or statement approval here and there, and um, then you would, could then decide whether you like it or not. I would presume you would come yeah. back with that's the trust fund, but the, the transfer tax, oh, the we didn't talk about a specific, we didn't talk about the no, exact tax no, or the... No, the trust fund, I'm uh, sorry. That's okay. No, the reason why I asked, Jenny, is I, I, I'm just going to play the devil's advocate here and say, look, if we add a, 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 another burden on, um, um, we use the nasty word, development, okay, and prohibit development, mm -hmm. then uh, I'm concerned about that. And if it's not, I'm okay with that. But I don't want to put another layer of burden on there saying, oh, well, we'd rather go to the next town over. They don't have these kind of t taxes to stop. Uh, um, well, so the tax is one mechanism to get resources into the trust fund. The trust fund, again, is a separate proposal and is there for a different reason and wouldn't be burdensome to I, development. I realized whatsoever. what you're saying. Okay. If the trust fund is the trust fund, mm -hmm. but how you fund the trust fund, mm -hmm. okay, is a question I have right now. Yeah. And how we fund that trust fund, how we fund that okay. is the first part of my question. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm last an answer, but I'm just saying I, I have concerns about because I don't want to put additional burdens because right now, I don't think uh, we want to do that, or if we do want to do that, then, then let's decide okay. openly, decide that. And then the other one is, when well, we have this trust fund, what is their mantra? Are they going to develop single point of uh, affordable housing units, like they'll build a project, or are they going to try to integrate? Uh, I know some towns are partnering up with um, developers and integrating and having their part of their fund so the, the affordable housing are integrated with market rate housing so it's not so there's a blend of neighborhoods in this development it's no longer a project affordable housing that's all by itself it is it, it's, it's I don't want to create a, a neighborhood like that I, you know, I, I want it to be integrated so I'm just, I just wonder what the mantra would be, say, okay, this is going to be a partnership, or is it going to be sole proprietary, we're just going to go buy a piece of land and we're going to develop it. 
So we haven't got, first of all, the, the trust fund could be designed a number of different ways. One of the, the documents that I posted with this, this agenda item is this Municipal Affordable ha Housing Trust Fund which Guide. Which is fantastic. Book, which does. Okay. Yeah, it was, okay. it was a really nice, good read. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Because yeah. um, it walks you through kind of the, the various ways in which we could design one of these trust funds, what they might look like, how the level of powers that they might actually have, and then the ways in which you can actually leverage, leverage different types of funds into the trust, which are many different, you know, it could be grants, it could be donations of land, donations of other of homes. I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways in which to leverage property. The goals and the, the structure design of the trust and what they're actually doing would be designed in the charter that we would need to create. So this is really just an early conversation with you to talk about that, I guess. Could Can you I just make one comment? Yeah, um, yeah. To, to, yeah, so what, what Jan said is correct. But, um, the reason why we, um, why we, why I feel this is really important is that we have already lost money by not having this fund. Um, and we do not need to pair this up with the transfer fee initiative. Those can be completely separate. If you don't like the transfer fee, forget it. Um, but that, when, when I was um, w watching the 40B, the, one, the main 40B we have in Brattle Street, um, I found that we, um, we, t we, did, we were not able to really aggressively secure a half million dollars in excess profits made by the developer because we did not have a trust fund, an affordable housing trust fund. And it required that those kind of funds be put in an affordable housing trust fund. So, you know, I just, having lost money already, I, I'd kind of like to be ready for the <laughs> next time, you know. Um, but yeah, point out, if you don't like the transfer fee, you can catch it. Um, I, I like it, but I mean, I'm not a developer, so. Well, I'm not saying I like it or don't like it. I'm just trying yeah. to yeah. understand the whole mm -hmm. thing. Before, you know, just not just saying, yeah, it's a good thing, that's all. I'm just asking questions right now. Uh, I'm not saying no to either or both or either or one. Yeah. I, I guess a few things. I, I agree. I thought it was really helpful to get the guidebook and have the opportunity to read it, so thank you. It was really good. Um, I think having the trust fund is a good idea because it gives the town another tool and more flexibility mm -hmm. and in to be able to get money and to spend it on affordable housing. Um, and thinking about that a little bit, there are a few things that I would hope are or are not in there. I would hate if things had to go back to town meeting once it was in the trust fund, because one of the beauties of the trust fund is the money is in it, and when there's an opportunity, they can get it right away. Mm -hmm. If things have to go back to town meeting, it's almost like ruins half of the opportunities that they're going to have. It, it puts maybe, you at a distinct maybe, disadvantage of having right, to wait that long. Yeah, to have right, as opposed first. to the board of select, you know, the select board, which mm -hmm. meets every week or two, mm -hmm. they may be the appropriate elected officials right. to say something about it. But having town meeting, having to vote on it, basically ties at least one of its two hands. Yeah, it could make back. things even more cumbersome yeah, if, yeah, right. if you're funding yeah. it from so, CPA, yeah. say, and then yeah. you have to go back to town meeting again it, to spend money out of the so, trust fund. So, that, so that's, that's one of my concerns, that we be at least partially defeating the purpose if, if town meeting got to step in once it was set up. The second is, and I know this can happen in the trust fund, I would hate if the trust fund started taking funds from developers because so they didn't have to build affordable units. Because that's been a real problem in Boston and other places where the money's sort of somewhere in the BPDA, formerly the BRA. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would not favor a trust fund where that could happen. I would want the developers to have to build the affordable units at, at the locations. And third is to think about who should be on the trustees, I think. Not who, but what what organizations, et cetera, are designated, I think, is going to be a real important decision mm -hmm. to make. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not quite sure who those all should be, other than I think it has to be thought through very clearly. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a great opportunity for the town. And whether we work <coughs> with a transfer tax or not, I mean, my personal opinion is there should be a statewide transfer tax and not simply one for Arlington and maybe 
the issue should be, that that will happen. There, right, there's the like issue, separate legislation. Right, right, so the issue should be, should our election <coughs> be pushing its own, or should we be pushing our elected <coughs> officials to try to get one that's statewide? Mm -hmm. But that's a separate discussion. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and my, my two questions really were brought up by the, again, the guidebook, which I found really helpful. So, you know, my questions really were, what, what are we really specifically trying to accomplish, which, you know, you identified as something that you'd be working through as part of the, the charter. Um, and then where are the funds coming from? So if there are funds that are currently allocated elsewhere, I think it would be good to understand where they're going to be diverted from and whether or not that has any meaningful impact, or is it really an opportunity for us to secure funds that we haven't had the opportunity to pursue before because we haven't had the proper channels to, to receive those those funds. Those are my kind of two questions. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I generally am supportive of the idea. I'd like to see a plan that would be you know sort of town specific that we could work with um, <clears throat> and, and answer some of those questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if if there were a charge to the committee, then you know get get to work on it and show us something that we can work with and have a discussion about if it's the select board that has to ultimately approve it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I would hope that they would listen to whatever recommendation that we had to make about it since you know, affordable housing is generally our purview, even though the management of the trust fund might, might not be. Um, but I'd definitely like to see some more work done on that. And we, we do talk about affordable housing, and I think there needs to be some, there, there do need to be other options out there to fund and encourage affordable housing in town than just the inclusionary, uh, the inclusionary zoning. And zoning can't solve all problems, unfortunately. So it's time to start looking at other other means and methods as well. So Great. have at it, please. I look forward to seeing what you come back with. Great. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's sort of uh, timing-wise. Tomorrow is the opening of the board mm -hmm. for town meeting through January, and so that's why mm -hmm. I wanted to bring this to you this evening. Mm -hmm. We had actually hoped that tomorrow morning that. Housing Plan Implementation Committee was supposed to meet to discuss this and debrief and talk about our next steps. Of course, that's been postponed what? due to the, sn um, yeah, the snow. <laughs> we have a, the <laughs> town hall doesn't open until 10 a.m. tomorrow, so we, for everybody, <laughs> uh, okay. FYI, town hall doesn't open until 10 a.m. tomorrow, so we, we will not be able to meet and tomorrow. And schools are canceled. Schools are just canceled. Schools, schools are, canceled. are canceled. <laughs> Just got the text, everybody. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, we'll we'll find a different time to follow up, and we have enough time to develop the proposal and bring it back Good. alongside the other things which are under your purview, which is the zoning. <coughs> All right. So thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Karen. And we'll move on to potential zoning bylaw amendments for 2020. So Jenny, walk us through where we are here. I know there's some other additional materials, and I'm sure there are people that want to speak. So yes, yep. and so what I've provided to you this evening is a memo that I drafted, which basically pulled together um, potential zoning amendments that are coming from any of the committees that we're working with. These are sort of town-led types of initiatives. Some of them, um, you know, are coming from either, you know, groups or committees that we're working with. Some of them are, you know, basically administrative items that need to be cleaned up. Um, but it, it also kind of gave you an opportunity to get a status update a little bit more so than the one that I provided in a previous meeting of what's happening with different committees and different planning processes and give you a sense of the timeline of when you might anticipate some of those zoning amendments coming to a future town meeting or to this board, of course, first um, as part of that proposal to a future town meeting. Um, so that's that's primarily what my memo is about. That doesn't mean that there haven't been other proposals that have been that have come up from either residents or people at, you know, in conversations and meetings. Um, one of those more formal ones came from Chris Loretti, which is a separate memo um, that I've attached and that we've also previously discussed. I believe this evening we received a, a copy of something that actually we had looked at previously when we were doing zoning recodification. Uh, which came from Patricia Warden, and um, I know that there have been other comments that have come up from other members of the public. Those are not all incorporated into my memo. My memo was really an opportunity for me to provide you with, you know, some information about the different types of plans and planning processes that may lead to um, some zoning recommendations. Some of them may not, by the way. <laughs> I'm also aware of that. For example, the transportation plan, I'm sure there will be some zoning recommendations. My guess is it will heavily be on things that don't have anything to do with zoning. 
Um, and then I provided you with uh, an update of the, the work that we're doing on the stormwater bylaw, the town's stormwater bylaw, as well as our compliance with the MS4 general permit. Um, and that are, those are things that I've talked about in the memo in terms of things that we will need to more imminently address, which includes some amendments to the environmental design review um, criteria and some other areas in the zoning bylaw as recommended in this memo that's provided by Horsley Witten Group. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I wanted to add in terms of just a quick overview of where we're at. I'm, you know, this is really meant to be a, a conversation about these potential zoning amendments and the next steps. As I mentioned, the warrant article is just opening, so we have some time to kind of move things forward. I guess one thing of, of importance is that's not in my memo is a follow-up to the conversation that we obviously started at Springtown meeting with regard to housing recommendations. And I know that there are there have been many people who have asked about the status of those recommendations, what will be happening next, um, when will the ARB be meeting with the select board. And uh, Adam and I are hoping that at least we can have a meeting with the select board in January. Again, the date of that meeting is still not there yet. The select board in their meeting tonight is talking about their meetings for uh, 2020. So they'll be solidifying those evenings and then I'll have a better sense of when that joint meeting might be able to occur. Um, and that meeting is meant to be the opportunity for us to together talk about the plan for how we want to move forward with those different housing actions, which could be some zoning and some non-zoning recommendations, as well as the community participation plan, how we want to engage people, what we want to do, and how we'll roll things forward to a future town meeting. Mm -hmm. We had, of course, as everybody knows, been discussing a special town meeting in the fall. That's not up to this board to decide or call a special town meeting. That's up to the select board. So I think we'd have to decide on where we're at and if we feel we've had enough or sufficient participation in order to get us to a point where we think we're ready for town meeting. We've got a summer in between there, so it might be, might be a challenging time, so we might want to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's what I wanted to share with you. I'm open to your questions. I'm sure there are people here this evening who also have things to add. <laughs> Just a guess. Sure. Um, I'll start with Rachel down the other end. If people have questions, just comments. Um, I'll be quite honest, I'm still reading through a lot of the, especially the, the stormwater storm mm -hmm. piece. Yeah. Um, so that. I think it sounds like um, there's a little bit of, of time to continue yes. to, to review, so um, I'm going to defer. Okay. G. So let me start with the stormwater, mm -hmm. which is a lot, and mm -hmm. you can drown in it, but I think mm -hmm. I do that uh -oh. on purpose. Nice. And, um, <laughs> um, but yeah. um, I guess my, I guess most of it or all of it, I think, does not involve any zoning bylaw amendments. It seemed to me that rather than even thinking about amending the zoning bylaw, that the current environmental design standards mm -hmm. are broad enough so that when we know what the town's um, stormwater bylaw is or whatever the town ends up doing. I think we can just draft a guidance document that okay. says this is how we're going to implement these environmental design standards mm -hmm. when it comes to stormwater. So I haven't sort of thought that fully, but as I was reading through the whole MS4 yeah. thing, it, it sort of occurred to me that we, we may not need any zoning bylaw changes, but if we don't, I think we want a document that tells people how we're going to implement mm -hmm. those when it comes to stormwater. Right, and I should add, these are purely recommendations. You know, it's a bylaw review. They reviewed multiple bylaws, yeah. the town bylaw, yeah. the Conservation conservation Commission regulations, right. um, and they are recommendations. And I think that what you're suggesting, Jean, would be more than sufficient in terms of meeting the criteria. Yeah, and there was one, and, and they talked a lot about something that Conservation Commission, I've forgotten what it is now, already has a responsibility to do mm -hmm. under the Wetlands Protection Act. So. You know, I don't know whether the Conservation Commission needs to adopt any regulations for that, but they certainly... They're talking about it as well. Yeah, they certainly so. have a lot. On, on, the, um, on, the, on, the, on the housing ones, and I think we've all said this, we're not going to be ready to go to Springtown meeting with any housing, housing uh, bylaw amendments because we haven't done the groundwork for it. We haven't met with the select board. We haven't had community meetings, et cetera. 
I was thinking what we would do for spring is just go with very technical amendments and things that need to be edited because there are some errata that need to be fixed up, things like that. And I think most of what you put at the bottom of page two of your memo are those sorts of things that I think we could probably go to town meeting with um, pretty easily. The one thing I was very disappointed, and I've gone to a couple meetings of what it is, the energy... Task, net Zero Planning. The, the Net energy, Zero... The Clean Energy Future yeah. Committee. Sorry. And, That's and, the name of the committee. And I was <laughs> going to say something at the meeting the other day, but I got called away and couldn't stay mm -hmm. through the meeting. I think they're doing a really nice job and are very methodical about their doing. And a lot of what they're focusing on is what are we going to do with all the existing infrastructure that's not particularly energy efficient, that generates a lot of greenhouse gases, and what can be put in place mm -hmm. to, to make that better. But the other piece is what can we do now about new construction and new development? I mean, personally, especially because of the UN report that came out the other day, this is critical, and each year, I think, more new things get built that don't meet the standards we would want them to meet. And I just think the town each year misses an opportunity by not getting some bylaws in now to require new development to be much better when it comes to energy. And the two things that I've mentioned this at one of our meetings and I mentioned this at one of the net zero meetings that I think we should be doing is the Watertown ordinance from last year requiring solar with certain exceptions on larger buildings. And Brookline beat us to it, although I think I might have had the idea at the same time, the no more fossil fuel infrastructure for new development because they can do it with electricity now. And I think that the town would be making a mistake by waiting a year or two for the net zero plan. The net zero plan has a lot to do, and a lot of it needs more thought. But those two pieces are, I think, low-hanging fruit and things that need to be done right away. So I would hope that that committee comes to that conclusion and makes those recommendations to us to do the Brookline and the Watertown pieces. So that's the other thing. I agree with I you on those. Thank you, David. <laughs> I think one thing with the with the Brookline bylaw, since I um, I'm very familiar with that bylaw, um, that uh, we, I think awaiting to find out if the AG's office actually approves the bylaws is very important uh, before deciding whether or not it's the right thing to do and carry forward. There are many other municipalities who are very excited about that bylaw and are also kind of in the w waiting in the wings um, to see what happens with but, that particular zoning bylaw. So I think we should get something just on, a, the on, the warrant, the on the warrant for those two. Mm -hmm. That's my thought anyhow on those two. And the, and the point I've made here is just that it is part of a net zero planning process where we're looking at metrics, we're looking at understanding what is the impact of these different potential right. recommendations, a, a whole host and suite of different things to figure out what will be the impact. Is that committee going to be meeting soon? Can we communicate that? I can, we can the meeting on December 20th. Yeah, there to them. we both, uh, three of our staff okay. actually go. So we would have time, theoretically, to communicate that to them. Absolutely. Have them bring something to us for... Springtown meeting, I would think. I'm not sure about that part um, in terms of that committee bringing something to the board, but I can talk with them about it, of course. They're working on the net zero. Keeping in mind that the warrant is the warrant, the actual article is a much different idea. That's a good point. Idea. Yeah. I think there are other people who are interested in it as well. So if it's not sponsored by the redevelopment board, it's likely to come up regardless. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'm just cautious about um, moving, uh, about, uh, about recommending uh, that articles be put on the warrant when we don't ha have a clear understanding of what the actual warrant article will be, um, because that's, that's um, caused us, um, that's complicated our, our progress in the past, let me put it that way. Um, 
so uh, I, I hope that that whatever ideas are, are being considered um, kind of come, come to fruition sooner rather than later um, so that we can look at them um, before we have to decide whether or not to to recommend a uh, Warren article. Um, I think I, I do wish that we had been able to move forward a little sooner uh, with meeting with the selectmen and um, and doing um, the um, more of the the public engagement that we talked about doing on on uh, housing and and zoning um, after after last spring's town meeting and um, I'm um, I never thought we were shooting for 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 spring 2020 um, but uh, and, and I know we're not um, but um, I'm I'm um, worried that that uh, we're, we're already pushing the limits of being able to do the kind of engagement that we that we wanted to do before bringing other proposals before town meeting even for next fall um, so uh, I, I think we should we should um, proceed as expeditiously as as we can but um, make sure that we take the time to um, to to do the process as we originally envisioned it, mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether that means uh, moving to a subsequent town meeting. Well, and, and the fall special town meeting thing, I mean, that's that's been the historic thing until we came along and did recatification in February. So, um, you know, there's... <laughs> There's other possibilities in terms of a special time meeting date. So let's let's continue there, there to think. There are other things happening in the fall of 2020 that may that take is, the that's year. That's a very good point. Yes. Special town meeting. Yes, I believe you're correct. <coughs> so I think that the, yeah, a, yeah. a special town meeting at a different time is probably wise, yeah. regardless. And I, I do think we can um, uh, certainly move forward with with some of these more technical mm -hmm. corrections, um, in, including uh, at least some of the things Mr. Loretti. Um, proposed, um, and we can we can continue to discuss those. Okay, Ken. Uh, I, I echo what Deb just said as far as uh, about uh, discussing these uh, warrant articles or understanding of what we want to present. But I want to take it a step further. Can we set up an agenda, or at least try to? I mean, yes, we can't set up an agenda right now. With the select uh, select board, but we can set up an agenda with let's say all the committees that are involved right now. Get so we get their input in. Uh, any citizens that want to put their uh, set an agenda for them, and then I especially want to set up an agenda for us that we have time to discuss all this amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. This seems like what we're saying. I want to be able to discuss it and maybe massage it a little bit so we have our, mm -hmm. um, uh, our views on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, can I suggest that we maybe, maybe not, uh, December's gonna be busy, I know that, but maybe starting next year, we'll say, okay, you know, this month is for committees that will give them enough tense to get their mm -hmm. uh, points across uh, anybody that wants to make uh, comments or want articles can submit there and then give us a chance to look at those and look at our own. Mm -hmm. And when, when does the warrant close? Um, January 20, I'm going to say the wrong date, sorry. But so it's, it's right. typically, be, uh, yeah, towards the end of the month. I don't know. So it will either be the 24th or the 31st? I think it's the 24th, okay. actually. I, I want to say That's that. what, spring? Yeah. Yeah. For spring annual. So we have a fairly packed calendar schedule, calendar agenda <coughs> on our next meeting, which is the 16th. What? Oh, it is the 31st. Okay. 31st. Um, I would not suggest putting anything else on the agenda for December 16th. No, the, that meeting will be. That's, that's no, no. Right but meeting. I'm talking but, about. But I think the first meeting in January, we can do that. Our first meeting in January is January 6th. And yeah. I think I would like to dedicate that entirely 
to okay. a discussion of potential warrant articles, whether they be okay. from uh, proposed by members of the public, such mm -hmm. as Mr. Loretti or Mrs. Warden, or the department, mm -hmm. or <coughs> committees through the department, or anything that, that members of this board would like to uh, send to you and have put on the future agenda. That will give us okay. time to uh, at least put the warrant article in. And again, you know, the warrant article is separate from mm -hmm. the actual article to be debated at town meeting. Right. Uh, David, I understand your point. Uh, however, I think so long as we're careful not to put an entire suite of articles across the board uh, <clears throat> that all sort of work together, we will be doing each other a favor um, and doing things in the way that we've done them in the past uh, with some time to communicate and, and have some real discussion with folks. Yep. So we'll make sure that January 6th we have that as an agenda item. I will say that uh, warrant articles are typically filed with with Doug Heim, so I will work in converse, in you know consultation with him to see what warrant articles were actually <laughs> filed by that timeline. I mean, mm -hmm. most people wait until towards the end of the month, so we'll we'll see what we can talk about. If, if, in other words, we might review some warrant articles, but not everything at that meeting. There might be things that are proposed that will come to us in another time. I I think having a general idea of what's coming yeah. is probably best for all. And there are people that wish to speak to sort of garner support for their articles from us or want to go out on their own. That would be a wise thing to do at that time. That gives everybody plenty of time to put things in the warrant if need be. So, whether they are sitting here or not this evening. So, all right. Will that give us enough time to talk about it? I think, uh, so that'll, that'll be enough time for us to talk <coughs> about the actual warrant article or the, the stumps that go in the warrant for town meeting. Then we have from January to April to work out the final language that actually goes to town meeting on what the mechanics and the specifics of any given warrant article would be. So your, your general warrant article would say to see whether the town will vote to adopt a <coughs> affordable, an affordable housing trust fund or take any other action related there too. Then you get into the specifics down the road. Here it's just saying, Yes, we think that we'd like this to potentially be considered in the town meeting, or pull it back, take no action, and mm -hmm. move forward. Last year's timeline was different than it has been in the past, but I don't want that to frighten us off from doing some of the mechanical things that need to take place and allowing for the public input on certain warrant articles that will really live or die with the support of the ARB moving forward. Um. Okay, that I understand. If, it was, if we want to make zoning modifications, mm -hmm. um, what if we're also saying we also want to look at maybe I'm not saying <coughs> maybe looking at uh, <coughs> PUDs in certain areas of that. Is, that. is that on the table that we can talk about? I don't think that's on the table right now. I don't. I don't think we have enough time to do that kind of legwork, that kind of homework for. Spring town meeting. Oh, well, maybe not spring town meeting, maybe it's fall. I, I just want to sort of put that sort of on an agenda just because when I look at uh, how Mass Ave and Broadway and all these other areas that we look looking at, mm -hmm. how it's zoned, it's like cookie cutters. It's all, yeah. it's all chopped up every which way. You can't get anything together to do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So unless we take a broader picture as a whole, and look at the uh, like areas. And I'm not saying from one end of Mass Ave to the other end of Mass Ave, because that's not right either. But we, but we just look at and understand that you know, along Mass Ave, there's certain nodes that, uh, that, that may be uh, good or maybe not be good. And certain areas, we'll just keep it the way it is, certain areas we can. But I just want an opportunity for us to discuss this and see if we sure. what, is there areas to push that along somehow. Yeah, I, I think we've got well, another, another example was in the student's presentation tonight where it was that the Leahy Arlington area, you don't have to rezone all of Broadway to say that those particular parcels need to be rezoned so that you can do something else with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just agreeing with you. Okay, yeah. But I just want to look at, you know, talk about that. 
Yeah. And if we all say, no, it's not the way to go, then okay. But at least we talked about it. Well, I think we should. <clears throat> yes, I think we should have that conversation. I think a lot of that conversation or some of that conversation goes hand in hand with the discussion to be had with the select board. Yeah. Um, not all of it, because not all of it is housing. Much of it is what do we do with these mm -hmm. commercial districts. Mm -hmm. um, the presentation tonight was sort of a reminder that Mass Ave isn't everything. I think sometimes we tend to think it is. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that's a parallel conversation to have with the, the conversation we have to have with the immediate time frame, which is getting to town meeting in April. So yes, we will put that on a future agenda item um, shortly, soon. Because I don't see that town meeting is necessarily going to take up uh, the amount of time that it has the last two sessions two rounds with the recodification and then with the housing. So um, at spring time meeting, you mean discussion. this year? Mm -hmm. no, no, no. No, I think there's, so. there's room to have no, this I, discussion now. So I now think January spring. 6th is a good time to have, to pick up what you're talking about now and, and expand upon it and hopefully also know when we're going to have the conversation with the select board. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. And I just, one other thing I forgot to mention is that the select board actually recently voted to allow for sort of a reworking of the warrant articles so that zoning is actually going to follow i think it's um you know there there will be other warrant articles before zoning so the order of articles is going to change that's just a sort of a heads up to all of you mm -hmm. usually it's it's always zoning first um so we've uh in in conversations with many people um that was proposed and the select board um recently adopted to move the order of the warrant articles so that's just something i wanted to bring to your attention No, no, I mean, nothing from me. No. Um, <clears throat> I know there will be, be time for members of the public to speak very shortly, but if you wish to say anything specifically about zoning, go right ahead now. Uh, Mrs. Warden, I'll call on you first. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I didn't quite catch what you said. Is this to be specifically about zoning? Or? Yes. Yeah, well, um, I think it probably pertains to it, so... Anyway, Patricia Wharton, Precinct 8. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I need to remind you that in the special town meeting of February of 2018, you informed town meeting members that you would take up the request to add a definition of foundation to the zoning bylaw at a later time. It is now more than a year and a half later, and so I hope you can consider proposing an article requesting addition of the definition for the next town meeting. The definition I propose is simple, and it's in the handout I um, gave you. It states, <coughs> building foundation is the masonry or concrete structure in the ground which supports the building. It does not include porches, depths, shafts, patios, single-story attached garages on slabs, carports, or the like. The purpose of this definition is to make it clear that the existing footprint of the house cannot be expanded without a special permit under section 542b6. If you approve this definition, probably many will agree with you and we can actually get a two-thirds vote at town meeting. We have plenty of small and medium older or antique houses in our region which are reasonably affordable. This is despite an unfortunate statement to the contrary made by the planning department based on selective and erroneous sampling not approved by the residential study group. These hundreds of small houses have made wonderful, naturally affordable homes for downsizing, retiring couples and starting couples who can raise the roof to expand for a growing family. But these houses are now targeted and brokered just for developers of massive rebuilds and are rarely available on the open market. The huge rebuilds that we often see um, are the direct result of the lack of the definition of foundation. The requirement for developers to apply for a permit if it's standing beyond the foundation's footprint and so create a fake foundation, including, uh, um, 
including carports, lab, doghouse, lab, and so on, is of paramount importance and is being bypassed. So a butter's rights to a hearing which they could attend and demand reasonable constraints and, if necessary, an appeal are being bypassed. I do know that such hearings and appeals can be successful here in Arlington, in one case near my house, where a hearing was required. The neighbourhood included an attorney who successfully argued to bring the planned building size down from around 8,000 square feet to approximately 6,000 square feet. Please pursue the insertion of a foundation definition in the zoning bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lurie. Thank you, Mr. Lurie. Just uh, a couple of question, uh, comments, rather. Um, I just wanted to be sure that the board understood that um, in the memo from the planning director, a couple of the things I had proposed in, in July are covered in that at the bottom of page two. Um, although I think the approach that she took is, is somewhat different. Um, I mean, I, I know it's different. And I, I would recommend that since these were clarifying what the tables are referring to, that the explanation that goes with the tables and belongs next to the tables, not in the text some pages away. So for example, the first thing I proposed was that when you um, have the limit, numerical limit for the um, usable and landscaped open space, it doesn't, it doesn't say just percent, it says percent of GFA. It seems to me that should be next to the table and not in the definition of gross floor area, which is several pages away. Um, which you wouldn't see if you were just looking at the table. And, and similarly for the, um, what a blank means in the table of use regulations, I would think should be next to the table itself. I mean, you already have a, a legend um, above all the tables that lists some of what the abbreviations are, like SP and Y, um, though I think those should be moved to immediately above the table of use regulations. It seems easy enough just to say what a blank means in the, in the same place. Um, and again, it's just a usability thing. Again, it's not, I'm not going to make a big deal about it because effectively it, it does accomplish the same thing. But I think from the user's perspective, it's easier when you're going through a, looking at tables to have all the explanation there <coughs> rather than in another location. Um, separately, what I didn't see is one of the suggestions or uh, things I would like to see is just the clarification that for um, in the definition of mixed use that uh, if it's added to that definition is text provided that each distinct land use itself is allowed by right or by special permit in the zoning district in which the structure the structure is located. Um, that's one I'm not, I didn't see in the memo, I'm not sure what sense either the department or you all have of whether that's something you would support or whether um, that would have to be a, a, a 10 registered voter article, but I would hope at least by the end of the next meeting to have some, some clarification on that. Um, and then just the other thing I, I noticed in your, the memo you received about the stormwater uh, issues, uh, and I'm hoping, as Mr. Benson said, that it's not part of the zoning bylaw, but if it were to be, a, some of these bullet recommendations seem to indicate that if particular measures were fulfilled, you could reduce the open space on a lot or reduce setbacks, and I didn't understand where that was coming from, and we support it. And if I could respond briefly, I agree. I don't understand why that was coming from. I mm -hmm. think in my reading that they be went beyond the bounds of where they needed to go. Mm -hmm. in it. Personally, that's what I thought. Right, I agree. Reading. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments about zoning specifically? Okay. We'll take this up again on January 6th. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving on. But that's more than a year away, so you don't have to worry. Okay, okay. Uh, meeting minutes from November 4th. Anyone have any comments, corrections as to those minutes? Yes. We just had um, one, um, page three, the um, first full paragraph there. My name is spelled oh. incorrectly. Sorry, it's. Not an easy one to oh, get yeah. right every no, time. That's <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then, um, rather than um, just below that, where it says the Atwood House has dangerous activities, I think yeah. I was yeah. referring to the allegedly illegal mm -hmm. activities. That's it. Okay. Anyone else, Jean? Just on the last page, mm -hmm. I think it should say Dover Amendment rather than just Dover Review. I think it should say Dover Amendment Review. Yeah. 
Sorry. Yeah, page yeah. 505, right, the top mm -hmm. sentence. Mm -hmm. I would just say a dollar amendment, which is just add the word amendment. Okay. Anyone else? David? Uh, a couple of things. Um, at the bottom of page 2, uh, there are two sentences uh, where I'm talking about the CVS signage. Uh, or asking if we have another alternative. And there are two sentences, one right after the other, that are very similar and I think could be condensed into one sentence. Uh, They're kind yeah, of repetitive. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And then uh, I had something else further along. I just thought you were being wordy then. <laughs> I may have been. You may have. Awesome. But, you, it, but, uh, but, but, <laughs> I, I, I could Possibly I could clarify <laughs> myself in the minutes. <laughs> um, I I think um, <laughs> why don't we just put in parentheses C T Great. I think there was something else. Um But I can't find it. Okay. One edit I still need to make is actually I need the name of the rep from that yeah, sign company, yeah. and I was going to put where it says point the name of the sign company. I'm going to replace it with the name of the person who was actually presenting. Um, so I just that's like an, an edit that I will amend that separately. I didn't catch the full name. Yeah, his so, spelling name was Gary. Gary something. So I move to accept the minutes of November 4 with the amendments made, suggested by the board. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So moving on to open forum, if there's anyone who wishes to speak this evening, separately from what they've already had to say. Can you just tell us what's on the... What you think is going to be on the agenda for the 16th? On the agenda for the 16th is the uh, hotel proposal on Mass Ave, I believe. Uh, Mr. Noyes from <coughs> CVS slash Atwood House is expected to be here. And the recreational marijuana dispensary at the Swifty Printing location. Right. Okay. It's in the auditorium, <laughs> actually, for that reason. Excuse me? The meeting will be in the auditorium. The auditorium? In town hall. The town hall auditorium. Yeah, like, downstairs. Yeah, nice. Like oh, big screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, uh, are, are there revised plans for the hotel that are available now? Or? We do not have They're not available yet. They will, as soon as they're available, they'll we be will on post them. Okay. They will be on the website. Okay. All right. Move to Motion. Good. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.